All right, it's two o'clock. So welcome to our Water Wednesday. And this time, Water Wednesday, it's a little bit different. So if you watched the previous Water Wednesday, we just live stream a talk on Facebook directly. And this Wednesday, we change our structure a little bit. We add a registration on Zoom. So for those uh, participants who register, now you are on our Zooms. So you can interact with our speaker directly after the presentation. So during the presentation, please turn off your cameras and turn off for your mute yourself for, um, and we will uh, arrange some Q&A session after the presentation. Um, and uh, if this is the first time you watch Water Wednesday, you may wonder what is Water Wednesday. So Water Wednesday is a Facebook live series uh, provided uh, by uh, the water experts uh, in University of Florida, IFS Extension. Every Wednesday afternoon at two o'clock Eastern time, we will live stream a 30 minute talk about Florida's water resources and what we can do to protect it. So far, we've co uh, covered a virus, uh, uh, a lot of different topics. So from like, does Florida have enough water to how to build your ring barrels uh, to emergency water supplies. If you miss uh, these uh, Water Wednesday talks, uh, I will post a YouTube channel link in the chat box. Uh, so you are more than welcome to go to our YouTube channel to watch all the recordings. Um, and for today's uh, Water Wednesday, um, it's about uh, how to save, uh, uh, let me turn off the camera for our, for our participants on Zoom. So for today's Water Wednesday talk, it's about Florida friendly landscaping. So we cover a lot of talks about Florida's water and how we can save water. Uh, and in last few talks, uh, we also mentioned uh, we use more than half of our fresh water in landscaping. So today, we have our guest speaker, Tina McIntyre, the Florida Friendly Landscaping Agent uh, in Seminole County. So she will show us, uh, she will give us uh, some quick tips uh, how we can save water uh, through Florida Friendly plants. So now let's welcome our guest speaker, Ms. Tina. Excellent. Thank you so much, Yi Lin, and thank you all for joining us either through Zoom or Facebook Live. I'm really excited to join you today to talk about some actual plants. I know we talk a lot about fertilizer and irrigation and all different types of um, Florida-friendly principles, but today we're actually going to talk about the plant species, which I love. And um, so I assume you can all see my screen. Um, like Elin mentioned, I just had a quick slide about all the great things that we do at Extension from our 4-H programming to our agricultural um, community support and our family and consumer sciences and all the work that we do through our Master Gardener program. So check out our websites, check out our Facebooks to learn more. So the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program, as you've probably learned if you watch some of our webinars or Facebook videos, um, has nine principles. And these are in the Florida law. And so it all starts with right plant, right place. When we start with the right plant in the right place, we're going to be kind of capitalizing on the evolutionary um, you know, interests of the plant. And so if it's in the right, pH, the right sun, the right water location, it's just going to thrive that much better. And we're going to have um, less pests and disease and things like that. So you can see the other Florida friendly principles include watering efficiently, mulching. Mulch is so great. It's its own Florida friendly principle. Fertilizing appropriately, recycling your yard waste. So thinking about, you know, reusing those leaves in your landscape as mulch and other things like that. Attracting wildlife to your yard, controlling yard pests responsibly. So identifying what insect might be in your yard, reducing stormwater runoff and protecting our waterfront and shoreline. So today I'm going to be um, really modeling this talk off of the Florida Friendly Landscaping Guide to Plant Selection. 
And this is available. I'll have uh, Yi Lin chat it to you guys. It's just a really great resource. Um, seems like it's not letting me um, copy this to chat right now. But um, if you just put in your search engine guide to plant selection and landscape design, you will get this free book. And it's produced by the University of Florida, Florida Friendly Landscaping Program. And the talk that I'm giving, I'll actually kind of call out specific pages in the book so that you can kind of go there and learn more later. So we're gonna start by kind of looking at what does it mean to put the right plant in the right place? So, you know, you might be in Central Florida, you might be in North Florida, South Florida, but there's certain regions that we say for South, for, for Florida. So if you're in Central Florida, it actually kind of tends to go a little bit up to the North incorporating Duval County. If you're in South Florida, it kind of cuts off around Lake Okeechobee because South of Lake Okeechobee, it starts to get very tropical. And so you can grow different, you know, species. And then we also have North Florida, which is most of the panhandle. And that's going to be, you know, your more temperate type, you know, plant species. Then we have our USDA cold hardiness zones. So these are actual zones designated by the United States Department of Agriculture, where, you know, they say, okay, this is this zone. And so for Seminole County, where I work, we're in zone 9B. And there's certain plants that may or may not thrive in that specific zone. So the first step is to learn what zone that you live in for this USDA cold hardiness map. So if you live in the north part of Florida, you're going to be able to grow some really cold hardy, um, which means that they're resistant to cold, so below 32 degrees Fahrenheit freezing. You're going to actually be able to grow those, those species in North Florida more readily, as opposed to in South Florida, where we get into zone 10, 11, you know, it's gonna be very tropical and the things can experience cold damage. And again, this is based on their evolution. And so these plants have evolved in different places to be able to be compatible with different environmental pressures. Then we have plants that are maybe native. So the Florida Native Plant Society designates a native as a species that has occurred within the state boundaries prior to European contact. So uh, according to our best available scientific and historical documentation. So we have good reason to, to think that this plant has existed and evolved in Florida for a really long time. And so it might have different adaptation or abilities as, a, you know, as opposed to other species. Then we have the growth rate, and this is particularly important. Um, they're all very important, all these aspects of right plant, right place. But the growth rate, the height, and the spread of the species that you're selecting will impact that landscape for years to come. And so we want to know how quickly that plant's going to grow and what the mature height will be and the mature width and the spread of that plant. Because if you're planting um, something under an awning or in a little patio type area, and it's going to get taller than the patio when it's mature, then you know you might have issues in terms of constantly having to trim it. And then if you're constantly trimming it, you're going to be inviting disease into that plant. So it really is best and most ideal to pick a plant that is going to be the appropriate height at maturity. And I know when we all start with that blank canvas that, you know, we've weeded all the weeds and we're ready to put in our plants, we want it to be lush and full. But, you know, really rely on your mulch here because you're going to, you know, you're going to give the gift of time for that landscape to blossom and grow. So, you know, we don't want to vegetate it with a lot of plants that are going to, you know, make it look full up front. We want to do exactly what will look good at maturity and then, you know, allow the landscape time to actually mature. And in the meantime, you can have that mulch or maybe some little ground covers that will, you know, kind of fill it in and allow for that changing, you know, height and width dynamic over time. 
The next aspect to consider when you're looking at a landscape and trying to select a plant is pH. pH is really, really important. Um, and people have wasted lots and lots of money trying to put plants in a pH that's not compatible with their, with their needs and with their evolution. So if we look at the pH scale, it goes from one to 14. Um, you know, right around six to seven is gonna be, um, you know, obviously seven is neutral. And so when we start to get into this area, this is very acidic. So if we have soil, which a lot of our native soils are fours, five, six, and that means that we really want to select plants that are going to be able to exist in a more acidic soil environment. And then the converse is true as well. If we have plant uh, soils that are testing in the sevens or eights, um, I've actually not seen nines or tens, though I'm, it could be possible. Um, you know, if you have soils that are testing in the sevens and eights, and you try to put, you know, some of our native species or blueberries or azaleas in those areas, they're just not going to do good. And there's no amount of fertilizer or, you know, care that you can provide to make that better, um, you know, other than relocating the plant. So, you know, we really want to encourage you to do a soil test. And what I recommend is, is doing a soil test to send up to the University of Florida laboratory where they'll be able to test for nutrients and uh, phosphorus and pH and micronutrients. So you get a really good understanding about, you know, what's going on in your soil and, and proper plant selection. Um, and we can also chat that form so that you guys can, um, can utilize that, that form. And I have a great video on soil testing I can share as well. So another aspect to consider is soil texture. And most of us are going to be in the sand. Um, you know, maybe if you're lucky, you'll have sandy loam. Um, potentially parts of North Florida will have some clay. But a lot of us are going to be in the majority sandy, uh, sandy soils category. And this really just kind of looks at the grain of, of, the, of the soil and how large it is, how small it is. Um, and what it's made of. And that, you know, obviously has an effect on our plant roots and our plant productivity. So it's just something to think about. There's little tests that you can do to try to figure out um, when you mix the soil with water, how much percolates out, how much stays kind of silted into um, that turbid water. And, um, but, you know, really most of us are gonna, again, fall into that sandy category. Another aspect to consider is soil moisture. So, you know, when it rains and we have one of these heavy summer rains, watch your landscape and see, is it percolating quickly or is the water tending to hold on site? And, you know, that will help you kind of better understand the soil moisture. Um, you can also change and alter the soil, the soil moisture holding capacity of your, of your soil by adding organic material such as compost, mulch, and things like that. We also want to think about preventing erosion because if you're having erosion, um, that's not going to be holding this, the moisture and the water on site. It's going to be diverting away from your site. So look for signs of erosion as well. Drought tolerance. So um, you know, you can have species that are highly drought tolerant, like this aloe pictured here at the top, um, and then things that are low drought tolerant. So a lot of our ferns rely on, you know, they've evolved in very moist and shady areas. So if they're put in a very dry area, they're just, again, not going to do very well, and they're not going to be very drought resistant per se. We do have a few species such as blectum firm that are great at, at you know, weathering our droughts in April and May, um, but, you know, it is, it is kind of species to species. And then finally, our sun, light, and shade. What's going on with our, our sun over the course of a year? What is that landscape experiencing in terms of sun? And I'll get into the details of that. So one other thing to consider when you're planning and, and, and you know, working in your landscape is attracting wildlife. That's one thing, um, you know, when you're selecting the right plant for the right place, think about those bees, birds, butterflies, pollinators, small mammals, and bats. 
um, to be able to provide food and cover for them. So let's talk plants. Now that we've looked at, you know, why we need to do a soil test, why we need to have the proper amount of water, um, you know, all the right plant, right place aspects, let's talk about the plants. So for a full sun environment, which I'm determining as six hours or more of direct sunlight to that area. So if it's dappled shade or dappled sun, however you want to say it, um, you know, it has to be direct. So if over the course of a long summer day or even a short winter day, that area is getting six or more hours of direct sunlight, then that is going to, these, these species are going to be appropriate for that area. So starting off with large trees, and again, this does correspond to our Florida Friendly Landscaping Guidebook, which is available to you free um, for download and, and using virtually. Um, you know, if it was a real class, we'd be giving it out, but um, right now it's just available online through the link that uh, we're sending you. Uh, pages 35 to 37, you can read more about longleaf pine, slash pine, loblolly, or sand pine. Really any of our pine species are a, a wonderful selection for um, Florida soils that have, um, you know, six hours or more of direct sunlight. I really like them because they provide what we call a self-mulching habitat. And so they're going to drop their pine needles and it's pretty much going to mulch below it as it grows. And, um, you know, you can just rake those pine needles up. A lot of people actually buy pine straw or pine needles from the nursery or the box store and use them as mulch. And so if you plant a pine tree, you're going to be kind of utilizing those. Sycamore is another great tree that's going to be suitable in most of our um, full sun areas. This is a more northern tree. So again, check the book on page 35 for details. Um, this video will be available for you to go back to kind of cite those specific page numbers. And so, you know, if you're kind of trying to jot stuff down, don't worry too much because we will post the video on YouTube and Facebook later for you to access those page numbers. Um, one tree that I really love, and it's in my neighborhood, my, one of my neighbors has it, is the turkey oak. And I really love this tree because it reminds me of our uh, beautiful sandhill ecosystems that we have here in Florida. And you can incorporate, incorporate a little piece of that into your, into your landscape. So turkey oaks are great for that full sun selection. Cypress trees, now these again will be a little bit wet and I'll talk um, more about that in another presentation that I'll be advertising later about wet landscapes. Um, but cypress trees are a great selection for that full sun environment. And although they do like it, you know, wet and need a lot of moisture, you could still select it if you, you know, are having uh, maybe a low, a lower area um, that's getting sufficient water. And then in Central Florida, we all love our oaks. so. Um, we do recommend the live oak over the laurel oak because the live oaks tend to be more, they're very much longer lived. And the laurel oaks only really live for about 50 years and then we start to see the decline and nobody likes to have to take down a tree that they've grown up with or, you know, watched grow for so many years. So the live oaks are a good oak selection. Also the white oak and more on page 36 with that one. So for full sun, some small trees that you can consider that, you know, you might not know about. Baccarus, this is a native Florida small tree. It starts off kind of as a bushy shrub and can be pruned into a more um, full type tree. It's also known as salt myrtle or um, salt bush. And you can see here the butterflies, these, um, these um, um, monarch butterflies are just really enjoying the flowers and the nectar they're providing. Um, so we also have Jatropha, um, Wax Myrtle, and Wild Olive. So pictured here, this is the Jatropha. This is a Florida-friendly plant. It's not native, um, but it's very hardy. Uh, you could propagate it from cuttings if you have a neighbor or friend that has one. And then it also provides in these red, pinkish flowers some nice nectar for our pollinators. So it's a great selection as a small tree. Uh, we have wax myrtle, which is pictured here. It does tend to bush out, so it will need some shaping. 
um, you know, as you grow it. And then wild olive, which has those nice broad waxy kind of leaves. Um, another great native selection. Some ideas for small shrubs. So I do like edible plants as well. Rosemary is a great Florida friendly drought tolerant plant that you can incorporate into your landscape as an aesthetically viable plant, but also an edible plant that when you're making your pesto or your, um, you know, whatever you're cooking up in the kitchen, throw a little fresh rosemary on. That's also very nice. Um, found in the Florida Friendly Guidebook on page 66. Uh, we have the rose. Now roses can be a little tricky for Florida because we do have high humidity. So with roses, you're gonna wanna, you know, specifically select either antique varieties or UF recommended varieties um, so that they're really compatible for Florida. Um, you wanna watch out just buying something, you know, at a big box store or, um, you know, just be sure about your rose varieties that you're selecting. Um, and trying to do a rose from a cutting of something that you've bought at the store is also very challenging because again, we are very humid here. We're very, um, you know, even if you're, in North Florida, you're still gonna have those humid summers and very wet. So a lot of fungicide is gonna be needed. So, um, you know, sticking with the vining old antique species or any varieties that's recommended by UF IPIS is gonna be a great bet. Uh, Bird of Paradise. So if you grew up in Florida like I did, when you see these, you know, you think Florida, though they're not native, they are drought tolerant and they have a, a beautiful tropical look to them. So. Um, check in the guidebook on page 66 to see if it'll work for your region and your zone. And then Texas sage. This is a really um, drought tolerant, obviously the name Texas, um, you know, kind of tells you that it's going to be a drought tolerant type species. It does not like that extra irrigation. So if you have a spot that's really dry, it's going to be a good selection again for that six hours or more of direct sunlight. And then closing out the full sun with ground covers. So I've actually planted this twin flower in my, my own landscape in my home, and I love it. It's really wonderful. It creeps out through the landscape, not too aggressively. Um, you know, it's, it's not a fast grower, I wouldn't say, but it definitely grows over time. It's enjoying the summer rains, and it flowers with these really cute little purple flowers. Um, also found in the guidebook on 71. We have perennial peanut. A lot of you might be familiar with this Florida friendly. Um, it is a great alternative to turf or if you're looking to vegetate some full sun areas with maybe erosion. Um, this is a legume and so it does provide that nice nitrogen fixation that can benefit other plants that might be you know, surrounding or, or planted in the, the nearby landscape. We also have railroad vine, page 71. Railroad vine is great if you love the Florida beach and you wanna kind of bring that feel to your house. This is found in our coastal dunes, which have, you know, either hurricane force winds or, um, you know, maybe rain and salt and maybe not a lot of water. It's kind of like our desert environment, so to speak, is that coastal system. And railroad vine is gorgeous. It's in the morning glory, glory family. And it has these beautiful purple flowers, which are really just um, exceptional to watch it bloom. So it's a great ground cover. Um, it can work in conjunction with other plants because it does have a vining type feel. Um, so it's a good selection. And then finally on this slide, we have shore or creeping juniper. Uh, these are going to be very slow growing, but you could add in a couple, you know, plants to kind of fill in the area over time. Very drought tolerant, very great for full sun locations. So now you might be saying, okay, well, I don't have any sun in my yard. So what do I do with all this shade? And we're defining shade as less than three hours of direct sunlight per day. So again, summer, fall, spring, winter that uh, landscape location is getting less than three hours of direct sunlight. So some possible shade shrubs. Well, gardenia is one of my favorites. Uh, it just has such a delightfully fragrant smell. It's a Florida friendly plant found on page 55. 
you can see it pictured here at the bottom in the middle. So they also sell these in dwarf varieties that, you know, if you don't have that big of an area or you kind of want to give that low feel under an oak tree or something like that, or, you know, not so big as to block a window, you can select a dwarf gardenia to look for those. We also have firebush, so you can see my little hummingbird head pollinating this um, beautiful firebush uh, tubular flower, which are red and crimson and orange. And these are a fantastic Florida friendly native and there's a lot of different looks to it. So if you do plant it, you could plant it in sun. It, it does well in sun as well. It's gonna give a little bit more of a red tinge to the leaves. When you plant it in shade, it tends to have those photosynthesizing green cells more available and it will stay a little bit more on the green side um, under you know a full shade environment so just a little variation in the leaves that you might see depending on the sun exposure for this plant and it's a fantastic pollinator so most pollinators love the tubular flowers and then as these flowers mature into berries birds love them so you can enjoy this this is also sold in dwarf variegated and full size varieties. So be sure as to which one you're purchasing that it's the right plant and spread and height for your place. Next, we have the um, bush trumpet, which is found um, here on the right in the bottom in yellow. These trees, it's you know a tree or a shrub, depending on how you train it and prune it, are um, a really beautiful yellow flower. And um, you know again, depending on the shape that it takes from pruning or lack thereof, it'll be um, you know, more of a tree or bush type. The yesterday, today, and tomorrow, these are quite amazing. A great Florida friendly plant on page 52. They start off as, as purple. And then as the flower starts to die, it actually changes from a deep purple to a light purple to a white. And so that's why it gets the name as yesterday, today, and tomorrow. These are great for a shady environment if you're looking for a shrub. I absolutely love them. And then we have our gingers and showing here on the top right, I'm showing the variegated uh, yellow and green ginger. This one um, is one of many. So you could plant turmeric as an edible harvesting crop. You could plant your you know, edible gingers that tend to sprout in your kitchen. You know, plant them in a shady area and they will, um, you know, do very well. Now you do want to watch out for our, um, there are certain varieties of ginger that can become invasive. Um, thinking of the one with the white flower, but just be sure to, sure to check the UF IFAS assessment, um, you know, before planting any of the ginger species. Most of them are not, but just double check that the one that you're considering is not an invasive species. And then ground covers for shade. So we get this question a lot, people trying to you know, have turf in a shady environment. Not many species of turf will thrive there. Um, there's really just one, which is the Floritam species of St. Augustine that will do okay. Um, but we really recommend, you know, try to incorporate some Florida friendly beauty. So I just actually planted these beautiful peacock gingers in my yard under my oak tree and they're already blooming. They look gorgeous. Uh, peacock gingers, again, are in the ginger family, but they're going to be much lower, so they're not going to, you know, kind of be in that four to five foot category. They're going to, you know, really just be under a foot, under six inches or so. Then we have our ferns. Tons of ferns. If it's a more wet area, you have a lot of options with shade and wet. This one picture here is the macho fern. This is typically available commercially at nurseries and you know, other locations. It does very, very well. Um, you know, I don't recommend the, the Boston sword fern, which is invasive. So be sure that you're not planting the Boston sword fern. That has little tubers, which makes it impossible to pretty much get rid of. I know because I'm actively trying to get it out of my yard. Um, and replace it with the macho fern. So um, the macho fern is native. It ranges all the way from Mexico to Florida. Um, just a really great plant selection. It's actually not in our Florida Friendly Landscaping Guidebook, um, but you know you can find more information online. Mondo grass. 
Mondo grass is a great um, substitute for any you know, shady environment if you're trying to swap stuff out. You can actually see in this picture, we have the dwarf Mondo grass and the regular, which tends to be a little bit more um, free flowing, a little bit longer on the stem, on the, um, the leaf. And this, you, it will not grow veget vegetatively at a rapid pace. So you are going to want to, you know, make sure that you buy enough to fill the space because over time they're not going to root out. They're not really going to grow. Um, they'll bush out, you know, a little bit, but typically you're going to want to purchase multiple to fill in the area. And then we have English ivy. Now this one will bush out. It will vine out and, and fill the area. A lot of people think of this as, you know, a vining plant on an old wall type of thing but it also makes a great ground cover and can be found in the book on page 71. So again, you can find any of these plants that I've talked about today in the Florida Friendly Landscaping Guide to Plant Selection and Landscape Design. We'll be sure to chat the link if uh, Yilin has not had the opportunity to already. And um, I will also tell you about our next well, not, it's not a water Wednesday, but we are going to be having with the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program an expansion on talking about the plants that I've covered today. So if you like this talk and you want to learn more about some plant species, join me on August 12th at 11 a.m. for a quick hour lecture on Facebook Live or um, through Zoom that you can actually learn more about these plants that are suitable for pH, for low pHs, for wet areas, dry areas, and we'll just kind of be building on this talk a little bit. So I, I will put um, the meeting information for Zoom and the Facebook link in the chat. And with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Lynn, for any questions. Thank you, Tina. That's very informative. I do enjoy all the plants you just posted. So please leave in the comment, what's your favorite plant? I do want to know because my favorite as of yesterday, today and tomorrow, and the first time I saw that, I was like, is that a real name? Then just like Tina told me, uh, I mean, just like Tina said, uh, another horticulture agent told me the reason why it was called yesterday, today, and tomorrow. I just love that plant more. And, and a few things I do want to let you know, it's I did, I already posted the FFL link, the um, plant gui uh, guidebook link on our chat box. Um, and for those uh, Zoom participants, uh, just uh, be patient, I will post you. And also want to let you know if you are watching us on Facebook Live, uh, please do not click any links uh, that are not posted by me or by the admin. Because um, for our last World Wednesday, our Ring Barrel class, uh, they got, we just got a crazy spam. So uh, put uh, the it, I couldn't even delete them. They were just like weeds. So they asked like, credit. it looked like they want, uh, it was the live event, but somehow they ask your credit card information or your personal information. So just wanna drop a note here, just keep in mind the UF IFS extension will never ask your credit uh, card information or any personal information. So please, um, be careful. And uh, if we go back to Tina's uh, question, um, if you are watching us on Facebook Live, well, please leave your questions here. You can see Tina has a passion um, for plants. You can ask her any questions about plants. And for our participants on Zoom, if you have any questions, that's the time for you. You can unmute yourself and ask Tina a question. Excellent. Thank you, Yilin. And um, just looking at the chat here to see if we've had any questions come in. It doesn't look like it, but I've also shared our soil testing form for those of you that are interested in getting um, a soil test. It is $3 per sample. If you do the basic test for the full test, it's $10. So not a lot when you're talking, you know, redoing a landscape, spending several hundred dollars, um, you know, quick soil test is is a great place to start. Awesome. I just posted also on our Facebook. 
Um, I'm looking at Facebook. I don't see any questions. Uh, I did ask that question, just uh, what's the favorite plants on Facebook. Now it's time to forgive me because I'm, I'm an engineer. I'm not really a plant person. I will try to pronounce it. Uh, um, it's uh, Zonius or Zinius. Uh, I don't know how to say that. Z -I oh. Xenia, yeah. Xenia. Xenias, yep. yeah. So Xenias, um, is there a uh, question or just Xenias in general? And Xenia, it's uh, her favorite. Xenia and the Cosmos. Oh, yeah. I love Xenias too. I actually have some blooming right now, which I was impressed that they're they're weathering the summer um, heat and rain. And they're, they're growing in a very organic type soil, high organic matter um, right by my compost. So I think that's helped them weather the, you know, the summer rains and, and hold that moisture. Uh, zinnias are an annual as opposed to a perennial. So a lot of the plants that I talked about today are perennials, meaning they live several years. Um, with annuals, you're going to have to save the seeds or hope that they're going to reseed like a wildflower every year they'll reseed. Um, and so zinnias are an annual and but they're, they're beautiful and they really are good to grow through the springtime. Um, you know, I have them growing now. I'm not sure that's totally recommended, but they're doing it in a good soil and then in the fall as well. Nice. That's such a good choice. Great. Um, I don't see any questions on our Facebook, but I know there's a 10 seconds delay between Facebook and the Zoom. So during this 10 seconds, do we have any questions on Zoom? If you have any questions, you can just put in the chat box or you can just unmute yourself, ask our speaker, uh, Ms. Tia. Oh, I don't know, I keep saying Ms. Tia, I'm sorry. Ask Tina uh, your question. <laughs> It's okay. Just one one letter different, one county different. <laughs> oh, it's uh, I blame it. I blame it on Zoom. <laughs> All right. I'm, seems Great. like we don't have any questions, uh, but. Again, if you have any questions that so you know, you can always post on our Facebook and you know Tina's contact info. Uh, you can contact her or you can just leave on my face uh, on the Facebook page. If you miss our live session, you will see um, our recording on the YouTube channel. I already post a link um, on the chat box. So you can just go to that link, watch the, um, watch it, uh, watch the Water Wednesday talk you will like. And also want to let you know, we will also post next week, we will also post our Water Wednesday recap blog, which will have some, the summary of this live talk, and we'll also provide you a link to our YouTube channel. So you can see, um, even you miss our live, se live session, so don't worry, we got you covered. Um, and if you like our talk, please give us a thumb up and we will also really appreciate if you can take our survey. I already post a survey um, in the chat box. Uh, so um, you, uh, we'll appreciate if you can take the survey and let us know how we can improve our World Wednesday. And while I'm talking, I just saw a question on our Facebook Live. So um, how long will hibiscus plants live? So hibiscus are definitely, well, it actually, you know, it, it depends. It depends on the species. So most of our species um, that are recommended in the Florida Friendly Guidebook are going to be perennial. And so they're going to live several years or even, you know, over a decade. They're very long lived um, if they're, you know, pruned properly and taken care of and fertilized, um, you know, and, and kind of supported. Now, there are other varieties of hibiscus, such as the red drop hibiscus, which has a million names, also known as Roselle, Sorrel, Jamaican Cranberry, Florida Cranberry, Jamaican Sorrel, Jamaican Hibiscus. Um, if any of those, it's the edible variety of, um, of hibiscus. And actually, Tia in Orange County has some videos on it. And um, that is a annual. So typically it's grown this time of year, um, you know, during the summer heat. And then the calyx is, what, is what's utilized as a food. It can be made into a jam 
or any, any type of way that you might use a berry. Um, people make tea out of it. That's the most common way that you might be so, um, familiar with it. And then there's another type of that edible cranberry hibiscus as well. I think it's called Panamanian hibiscus. And that's gonna have a very red stem, red, fla um, red flower, red leaves. Um, the entire plant is like a, a, a red, crimson red. And that's also an annual. So, you know, not all hibiscus are going to be um, perennials, but most of our horticultural hibiscus that are grown for their beautiful tropical flowers are going to be, um, you know, perennial. Great. Thank you, Tina. And uh, if you have more questions, so feel free to leave it there. I just shared the uh, last talk. Um, plants, uh, the information on our Facebook, it will also direct you to the Facebook page. So Excellent. I'm looking. Thanks, Elin. Yeah, I hope you guys can join us so we can talk more about these plants or other plants. It's one of my favorite things to do, so. Uh, we can tell you do love plants. So we, can we can also feel your passion through the screen. That's awesome. So I don't see any questions here. So I will thank for all your time watching this uh, Water Wednesday talk about Florida friendly plants. Uh, again, please give us a thumb up if you like it and follow us. Stay tuned for next Water Wednesday. So bye now and enjoy, you, the, enjoy the rest of your Wednesday. Bye.